So, um, firstly, thank you to the Havens Rights Centre for inviting me here and thank you all uh, for coming tonight. I'm going to assume some level of general familiarity with the themes that we're speaking about here. Most of you will be aware of Brexit in 2016 and that we had a very protracted uh, process that followed that, which has only terminated relatively recently. You'll know also that this has been a wrenching process of state transformation in the United Kingdom. And many of you will be aware that one of the uh, many conflicts that is going on in relation to Brexit is to do with the four national dimensions of England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales, of which the UK is composed. I'll speak more broadly about Brexit in the European Union on Thursday, so you can look forward to that. But today I want to kind of focus on this theme of the breakup of Britain, and particularly Scotland, um, which is likely to be the one country or one national dynamic of the UK, which might accelerate that. I'm very conscious in all of this that I am speaking to two separate audiences really here, and uh, perhaps more, but principally two. One of you will be in uh, Scotland itself, and you will know that this uh, topic dominates a lot of dinner party, uh, well, we don't have dinner parties because it's a coronavirus, uh, but uh, a lot of uh, online conversation, um, uh, family um, conversation, and so on and so forth, as much as our politics with an election due this May. For you, I'm kind of going to offer a broader perspective historically on what is going on and a more comparative perspective on uh, our own affairs in Scotland. There are also many of you who perhaps don't know so much um, about uh, Scotland, and I may have to convince you of why the breakup of Britain uh, matters. I guess to begin with, I'd like to stress three areas in which I think this is important, and this is developing some themes that myself and Pete outlined in a recent article for Jacobin. Firstly, Britain itself is a major uh, world state. If you think about the humanitarian interventions of the 1990s, the war on terror of the uh, 2000s, and even the 2008 financial crisis with the bailout of the bankers, you'll find Britain, the British state, very much ideologically at the centre of all of these processes, for good or ill. Largely, I would argue, for ill. Secondly, um, I think the question of Scotland in particular raises a number of questions when it comes to our thinking about European and Euro-American states, which is to say that there will be a lot of people looking on at what happens in Scotland with interest from, say, Catalonia, the Basque Country, Ireland, Quebec, and so on. Because Scotland challenges the idea that the state in these advanced countries is some sort of finished process and that there are no routes to self-determination. Lastly, I want to speak about this theme of populism, which is one of the major issues that we'll be addressing tonight. Because what happens in Scotland offers, I think, a lot of insights into what has been called the populist moment, with a succession of upsurges claiming to speak for the people in a largely undifferentiated sense, against a real or perceived Westminster establishment. It's going to illustrate many of the contradictions in this term, and also the variety of different forms that it can take, because what we see in Scotland is not, principally speaking, a right-wing movement, as many people might imagine populism to be. It is a movement largely of the left, pro-migration, anti-war, anti-cuts, and so on. As I hope to illustrate, that doesn't mean it's without its own contradictions. It just means that we have to be wary of what it is precisely we mean when we talk about populism, which can be a very divisive topic. Before getting on to the specifics of Britain and Scotland, I want to uh, lay out some general themes in relation to the political period that we've been living through, maybe for the past kind of three decades, but particularly over the last decade. One of the concepts that's going to inspire both my lectures is this notion of a void, of the hollowing of democracy that a political scientist called Peter Mayer uh, talked about. He was thinking principally of the 1990s and 2000s 
and he talked about a process of mutual withdrawal. On the one hand, there is the public kind of withdrawing from politics into their own affairs, becoming increasingly disinterested or thinking that politics doesn't really represent them or isn't really of interest to their lives. That is reflected in uh, a lack of engagement in political parties throughout much of that period. It's reflected in uh, declining voter turnout. And it's, in, in general, there's this theme of apathy. On the other hand, you have the withdrawal of elites who no longer try or even pretend to represent particular interests in society the way that the Labour Party or much of social democracy once claimed to speak for the working class. Politicians increasingly presented themselves as the most efficient managers of this void rather than being representatives of uh, specific interests as they once had been. Now, I think this is particularly interesting because since Mayer died, we've had what appears to be the opposite. Today, if you listen to any political debate going on anywhere, in particular in political science, all the talk is about a polarized electorate of populism and of the people being too politicized and too angry, riled up by demagogues, perhaps inspired by Russia, getting angry when they're reading social media, raging at elites and all these other things. You might think of Britain with families tearing themselves apart um, over Brexit. You might think of whole families in America that will not speak to each other again because of the issues raised by Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Or you might think of very similar things in Scotland in relation to the theme of independence. What you have um, is this apparent move from apathy to politicization. But I'm going to start by saying I think if you want to understand Scotland, Britain, or anywhere else, it's important that you reflect that there is a lot more continuity between these two eras of politics than might first appear. Because while populist movements have successfully mobilized by contrasting the virtuous people to the corrupted elite or establishment and so on, they are appealing to collections of individuals rather than to particular social interests. So you might say that populist politics is a revolt against the void that Peter Mayer spoke about, but it's also a symptom itself of the hollowing of politics. And so far it hasn't led to the re-engagement of the public in building collective institutional power in the old fashioned way of political parties and so on. A very last point before we come on to Britain is that much of this has affected the parties traditionally of the centre left that once represented the working class. And as a broad generalisation, they have been the people that have lost out most since the economic crisis of 2008. And the effect of that is that those parties, such as the Labour Party, have been unable to discipline, I think, particularly working class voters to the status quo. That's my sort of general set of very broad claims about the politics of the era that we are living through. Now, to understand Britain's crisis, I think you have to begin in the 1970s. We've got this theme of the breakup of Britain. This comes from a book that was written by Tom Nairn, which referred very much to this crisis of the 70s. And in this time, you had the idea of Britain in decline after losing its empire to the United States. Symptomatic of that, many people thought, was endemic class conflict in industry. You had upwards of 20 million strike days being lost in one year of the early 70s. Britain was dubbed the sick man of Europe. And there was a general panic that all this industrial unrest that was going on in Britain would eventually lead to a leftist takeover of the Labour Party, particularly under Tony, Bla Tony Benn. This led much of the uh, British establishment of the time to contemplate everything, including a military coup. Much of this was termed a crisis of rising expectations. Thinking back to that um, Peter Mayer thesis, essentially what the ruling elites of the time were concerned about was that people had come to expect too much of democracy and the public needed to be put back in its box. Um, and that was a kind of theme across world politics at the time, but particularly in Britain. 
this was also the period where you see the first resurgence of Scottish nationalism. Since the 1930s, Scotland had been considered one of the most economically uh, backward areas of the United Kingdom as a broad generalization. But the discovery of oil in the 19, late 1960s and early 70s kind of changed that. And suddenly you have this perception that Scotland could be one of Europe's richest countries. Of course, many of you will know that Norway discovered oil at the same time and subsequently would go on to be one of the richest countries per capita in the world. And in 1974, the SNP comes seemingly almost from nowhere and they get in the second election of 1974, 11 MPs elected, a significant share of the popular vote in Scotland and so on and so forth terrifying much of the establishment of the time as well. And nonetheless, uh, as quickly as Scottish nationalism emerged, it also disappeared in a sense, or at least declined. And that was due to a referendum, the first referendum in devolution that was held in 1979, which was I mean, it's remembered in a lot of Scottish history as being a great act of betrayal, because in fact, a majority of people did vote for Scotland to have its own parliament then. But due to various machinations in the Labour Party, that ended up not being the case. So it's often represented as this great moment of betrayal and this kind of great what if of Scottish history. What if we had got our parliament in the late 70s before Thatcher took power and so on and so forth? But you've also got to consider this from another side, because while we can agree that that might well have been a betrayal of democratic principle, there is also an interesting aspect to this. Despite the fact that Scotland had discovered oil, 48% of the electorate was willing to vote for a hard unionist position over a soft devolved position. And that in and of itself testifies to the fact that there was still a persistent idea at the time of a UK-wide solidarity whether related to the history of empire or to, um, to the very Labour Party-based idea of the welfare state. Significant sections of voters still expected that they could get something by remaining loyal to a British national project at that time. We have in this period, I'm sure you all recognize who those figures are, um, we have in the next period in the 80s and 90s an apparent reversal of many of these narratives. From Britain being the sick man of Europe, you have all these ideas of cool Britannia, um, which is quite frankly an abominable notion and I wish it had never been invented, but nonetheless, that was the way that things were presented. Really two things go on because you cannot speak anymore of a united idea of the UK after this point. Because on the one hand, you have uh, an economic boom concentrated in London, the Southeast, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, and this is very uh, broadly speaking, you have a collapse of much of the indigenous economy of Scotland, uh, the North, and so on and so forth, with a vast process of deindustrialization, which has left significant social damage that is with us to this day in much of these areas. Scotland today has the highest rate of drug deaths per capita in Europe. And you can blame that on the contemporary policymakers, but really it's a reflection of much of the social damage that was done in that period, or particularly in the 1980s. But nonetheless, you have this idea of Britain progressing. You also have the idea of Britain reasserting itself on the world stage. In 56, Britain had been humiliated by America over the Suez. It's funny how Suez is back in the news today and history repeats itself. But in uh, the early 80s, Thatcher revives the idea of a crusading Britannia, kind of intervening in world affairs, firstly with the Falklands, then subsequently we have the first Gulf War, humanitarian intervention, the war on terror, and all of those other things. You also have a vast transformation in terms of trade unions, because as I said, in the 70s, Britain was labelled the sick man of Europe. And this kind of maybe persists up to the minor strike. But afterwards, you have the most curtailed and controlled 
uh, labour movement, arguably in Europe. You have the, certainly the most draconian anti-union laws in Europe and so on. All of these things together lead to an ideological convergence between left and right, because Margaret Thatcher said that Tony Blair was her greatest achievement. And the crucial question I think here is to do with the themes of unevenness and agency. Everything that was happening organically in Britain was tending to empower London and the Southeast. This would become the center of government investment, economic growth, uh, and most especially of party political competition. By contrast, the rest was reduced, if not to passivity, then as far as the political establishment was concerned, to something of a backwater. It was often held that only voters in the southeast of England or representing particular what might be called yuppie layers were really relevant to uh, elections. They were called swing voters. And it was thought that they were the people you really needed to appeal to if you wanted to win an election. None of this was true, of course, of voters in the North. So relative to the 70s, we've got this big reversal. Britain on the surface seems to be booming. But considering the national unit in its constituent parts, there's less and less reason why voters might be loyal to the state. The converse of all this is a movement to devolution. Um, which is a kind of answer to a lot of these problems of the democratic deficit that emerged under Thatcher. In the 1980s and the 19, early 1990s, there was a kind of national popular mood of resistance to Thatcherism, particularly um, concentrated in Scotland. The most famous instance of this is the poll tax, but you also had resistance to factory closures, to the takeover of uh, Scottish industries, and so on and so forth. The Labour Party establishment of the time basically tried to channel this into a very official movement for Scotland to get its own parliament, something that they presented as a restoration of Scottish popular sovereignty. And that's at least how it was presented as this sort of payoff for Scotland's role in resisting Thatcherism as, as this restoration of popular sovereignty. The problem was that the Scottish Parliament coincided with the height of what might be called the Clinton Blair Schroeder consensus of neoliberal globalization. And thus, very specifically at the beginning of the Parliament, I read the economic reports of the time. There is this sense that all these takeovers that had happened to Scottish industries and all this damage that had been done in the 1980s, all of this was basically irreversible. And there was no sense in which there would be. Uh, the power of the state or of the people to reverse what was essentially the Thatcherite um, consensus. And thus, if you look at this period as a whole, you see some very broad trends that kind of link back in to this theme of the void that Peter Mayer spoke about. In party politics, you have a general decline in activism, um, and an enthusiasm in various different spheres. But I think particularly in constituencies with a working class base, which had tended to vote Labour in the past. It was often said in Scotland that a monkey in a red rosette could win uh, seats in certain constituencies. There was also a decline in collectivism, as might be traditionally understood. At one stage, Scotland had had the highest rate of social housing outside of the Eastern Bloc. But much of that declined um, in the years of Thatcher um, and of Major, and ultimately declined a little bit under devolution as well. A similar story could be told in terms of trade unionism. Not only were workers less likely to belong to a trade union, more importantly, I think they were less likely to exert their agency through a trade union in the mechanism of a strike. More broadly, devolution gave Scotland a parliament essentially under centre-left control, freed from Tory influence and all these other things. And yet we still saw all the broad trends of the void of which uh, Peter Mayer spoke about. Rising inequality, financialization and all these other things, and most of all, the decline in a lot of institutional collectivism. 
devolution was very consciously presented by New Labour as a restoration of Scottish popular sovereignty. However, it at best slowed and arguably in some spheres accelerated trends towards the hollowing of democracy. It's within this context, and I speak most especially to the audience outside of Scotland here, that I think you need to understand the significance of Scotland's 2014 referendum. It's one of these things where it's difficult truly to appreciate what it meant unless you were there. Because the headline figures do not appear to be massively significant. You have 45% voting for independence, 55% against. That looks like a relatively significant margin of people in favour of the union. But I think you have to understand that the referendum was only granted in the first place because it was assumed that the yes side stood absolutely no chance because all the establishment would be reigned against Scottish independence, barring the establishment, crucially, of the SNP itself. And uh, polls at the time the referendum started suggested that, well, support for independence was as low as one in four. But what you saw was an unprecedented activist mobilisation turning on themes of being against cuts, against nuclear weapons, being in favour of immigration, and so on and so forth. Much of it sort of left populist in general uh, spirit, and crucially concentrated often in some of those areas that you might call flyover Scotland, or areas that had traditionally voted uh, Labour in the most um, apathetic possible spirit. The result was a huge voter turnout and particularly very high turnouts in some of these most deprived constituencies, many of them voting uh, for the Yes campaign. So what also happens out of this, and this again consider Peter Mayer's thesis um, about the void, you also see this surge in party membership. The SNP had had 25,000, and this number is off the top of my head, so people are welcome to correct me, but I believe they had about 25,000 members beforehand, and that rose in the space of a matter of months to about 125,000. Subsequently, in the 2015 general election, they turfed out the traditionally hegemonic centre-left in Scottish politics of Scottish Labour. They were left with only one Westminster seat, which not coincidentally, I think, was in which one of the richest areas of uh, Scotland's capital city. The crucial point then I want you to understand about our Scottish National Party government is that much of its legitimacy uh, rests on this moment when it led a popular upsurge against Westminster rule. For many of the most disenfranchised voters in Scotland, uh, and for many young people and so on and so forth, this was the first time that they might have experienced a real sense of meaningful choice and political agency in their lives. And subsequently this, alongside events that happened with Brexit, has formed the basis of loyalty to the uh, Scottish independence project, which has in many ways gone from strength to strength. Now, I mentioned Brexit. Um, and I mention it like uh, advisedly because clearly since Brexit, there is a lot more publicity, globally speaking, about Scottish independence. And I would argue that Scottish independence has become significantly more respectable. Back when I was first uh, campaigning on the issue, back in 2014, I think you see on the left here, some of the discourses about Scottish independence that were presented from the political establishment. Specifically, these are from the Guardian newspaper, which most of you will be familiar with. At the top there, you have Will Hutton, speaking of it as the death of the liberal enlightenment before the atavistic forces of nationalism. Below, Tony Blair, him again, uh, speaking of it as the politics of the first caveman council and so on and so forth. So a lot of the metaphors that were being presented were about backwardness, uneducated voters, uh, stupidity, broadly speaking. Why are they doing this? This is against their own interests and so on and so forth. 
By contrast, much of this changes after 2016. Partly, I think, because much of what you might call the liberal establishment in London and much of England, which had previously assumed that Britain was this lovely cosmopolitan nature uh, nation with all these different national dynamics and so on, saw perhaps what might be called an uglier side of British identity and suddenly switched around. It's interesting, though, to reflect that a lot of these metaphors are relatively similar, this idea of primitivism, parochialism, etc., etc. And much of those same metaphors were used against Scottish independence, even though this was a movement that was largely socially progressive, pro-migration, anti-war, anti-nuclear, you know, etc., etc., we could go on. It is also the case, though, that now, that fact aside, Scottish independence has growing respectability internationally amongst a broadly liberal audience, but also amongst much of the elite, socially speaking, inside uh, the uh, Scotland itself, which some of Pete's forthcoming research, I think, will demonstrate very well in a statistical sense. And obviously that makes it much easier to be you know, out and proud about being pro-independence without anyone calling you a caveman or an activistic force of nationalism or all the rest. But nonetheless, it's also brought its own challenges. Because in Scotland, um, you've had this interesting process, particularly since 2016. The SNP remains a mass party. Uh, it sometimes refuses to publicize its membership figures, and we're not entirely sure how much it has declined or otherwise, but nonetheless, it's huge. Uh, in relative European terms, it's a mass party. But this has also facilitated what I call, uh, with tongue in cheek, the iron law of oligarchy, like in the sense that whether you call it an iron law or not, what has happened is that we have increasing centralized control of not just the SNP, but the independence movement as a whole. On the converse, you've had, until the coronavirus, the continuity of mass demonstrations, some of the biggest in Scottish history, arguably, depending on how you measure those things. But many of those have also been sidelined. Nicola Sturgeon has not been on those demonstrations herself and uh, has not publicised them and so on and so forth. And there has been a growing accusation that the SNP largely orients on the professional elite, my business opinion, and so on, rather than on this mass movement or on the working class voters that put the SNP in power and made it Scotland's hegemonic um, force. Many will see here the prospect of history repeating itself in terms of their new Labour predecessors. But this has also led to splits within the independence movement itself. Some of you will be aware that uh, Nicola Sturgeon's predecessor as SNP, Alex Salmond, has been involved in a number of different uh, battles in court and subsequently has uh, formed his own, well, not his own, but a new political party, which is also contesting the new election. I don't want to speak in great depth about that, although you're welcome to ask about it in the uh, question section. But what I do want to say is that there isn't a great deal of ideological difference necessarily between Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmond. Neither are left wing or right wing. Um, they are basically centrist political figures, broadly adhering to much of the sort of third way discourse of politics that dominated in the 1990s. Nonetheless, you've got different sides of politics trying to use these different political figures to articulate their own vision of what independence should be. Hence a lot of the splits that have happened recently. I think Scotland here shows in a much general sense that where you have popular upsurges in politics, they really do need to take their own institutional form. Otherwise in this very hollowed out context of democracy that we've had over these past decades, these popular movements can become contained, confined, and ultimately corralled into reproducing the dominant order. And part of the problem with that, if you only want to reproduce the dominant order, that's one thing. But inevitably, because we live in an era of economic decline and capitalism and so on, there is inevitably a backlash coming whenever you do that. 
and so hence we just see cycles of history repeating itself. So far I've largely spoken about Scotland, but I guess it's just worth taking a step back at this point and considering that there are various different national dynamics going on. In England, their populist moment almost certainly was the Brexit vote, which has subsequently led to the collapse of Labour's Red Wall in Northern uh, England and to a transformation more broadly in political geography, with Labour increasingly concentrated in London, university towns um, and big cities. Wales has seen its own dynamic with, uh, on the one hand, a vote for Brexit, but also an anti-Brexit spirit powering a potential nationalist revival. Ireland has, well, Northern Ireland has been um, all over the place in some respects. Um, you might remember when the Democratic Unionist Party joined in coalition with Theresa May's Conservative Party uh, to form the post, uh, the, the, the government putatively to see through the Brexit process, they ultimately would fail. All sorts of horrors emerged over the next three years in relation to that, that we don't need to go into. But there is now the prospect of a new border poll in Ireland, uh, particularly in the context of where Scotland might take the leadership in terms of independence. Ultimately, what I would say here is you've got some irreconcilable national projects going on inside the United Kingdom. And crudely put, I think the common denominator here is that centre-left parties can no longer act as the glue that holds working class voters to the state. In some ways, that's a much broader trend, as I've said, but I think also it's uh, taken a very specific and divisive form in the United Kingdom due to some of the nature of the state itself. Now, the big question, is Britain itself going to break? As you can see from that graph, there is an undoubted uh, historical trajectory towards a yes vote. Recently, there was 22 consecutive opinion polls showing a yes majority. That may have fallen back a little bit recently for the specific reason that a lot of the support that independence was getting was based in what you might call apocalyptic scenarios around Brexit. Now, Brexit hasn't been a picnic in terms of its economic impact and so on, but on the other hand, a lot of the waters have been muddied by the EU's incompetent response uh, to the vaccination process, which I'll come on to when we turn to the EU on Thursday. But nonetheless, you can kind of safely assume that at the very least, we're at a stage of 50-50. 50% for, 50% against, if not something better. So let's assume that we have a majority for independence. Then the question becomes, well, how do you engineer the process of self-determination? Back in 2014, the British political elite of the time, David Cameron and so on, permitted Scotland a referendum for the very specific reason, um, which you can read in David Cameron's book, uh, autobiography, if you like, that they thought that they would lose pretty badly. Um, and it would be something of a humiliation that would put Alex Salmond and nationalism in Scotland in its box and be a victory, a quick win, as it were, for the British state. None of that came to pass. And, you know, once bitten, twice shy, as they say, it's unlikely that the British political elite in Westminster will permit the another referendum without significant resistance, whether from inside Scotland or from elsewhere in the United Kingdom and so on. And it does seem to be the case that you will require some level of consent from Westminster, whether under duress or not, in order for Scotland's referendum, were it to hold one, to be able to be seen as legitimate on the world stage. Let's then assume though, that Scotland gets its referendum. Let's assume that that happens. We've still got some problems because in terms of the way that the SNP has presented its economic case, there are significant uh, areas of weakness. One of which is the declining significance of oil, both in terms of the collapse of the oil price that was witnessed after 2014 specifically, but also uh, in terms of morality, 
can you really found a new state on the basis of oil in this era of climate consciousness and so on and so forth? A number of those questions remain essentially unresolved. Then there are questions over what currency Scotland would use and its relationship to the, United, uh, to the European Union, which it uh, proposes to have. Because apart from anything else, the, uh, the two promises that they have made seem mutually irreconcilable. They want, on the one hand, based on the last prospectus, to use Britain's currency unilaterally without a proper central bank. On the other hand, they want to join the European Union quickly. Both of those things are probably not going to be possible together. And a lot of the tensions that have emerged uh, post-Brexit and post-coronavirus, post-everything, really have yet to be resolved in the mainstream of the SNP leadership's case for why they want ind independence. Even beyond that, what I would say is that there's a crisis in meaning surrounding the question of independence. The prospectus that is, ex that is there from Nicola Sturgeon's leadership proposes to hand control of monetary policy to the Bank of England, of fiscal policy to Brussels, of the military to NATO, and even of head of state functions to the Windsor family. And all of this kind of raises a question that I will come back to on Thursday, because for the SNP, this is a question of pooled sovereignty. You get this trade-off. Scotland sacrifices some rights, but it also gets a seat at the table. But that, to me, exposes a question, which, as I said, I will return to on Thursday, which is what do we mean by sovereignty? It seems from a superficial analysis that those who will be making the sacrifices in terms of sovereignty will be the Scottish electorate. The people who will be getting the seat at the table will be uh, the Scottish political elite. So again, there are some unresolved questions there. Equally, I don't see a progressive route back to Britishness under the current set of circumstances. I think the post-Iraq moment is particularly important. People always accuse me of banging on about the Iraq war. But there is a, an ultimate relevance to this, which is that since Margaret Thatcher, Britain has seen reasserting itself on the global stage as being a mechanism for reviving national identity. That was witness to, I mean, Margaret Thatcher probably wouldn't have won the 1983 general election, barring the Falklands War, but you've also seen this in various different spheres, and it kind of tended to escalate and escalate under Major, under Blair, and so on. Now, the problem for that is that war is no longer popular. Right? Uh, you cannot do the kind of engagements that Britain used to engage in in order to achieve some idea of national unity. If Britain were to engage in a war tomorrow, it would cause all manner of unholy splits in an already divided United Kingdom. Equally, there are all these divisions that have been left by the Brexit process. And Labour's kind of offer that they're, they have not even offered this properly, but the idea that they can solve this with some model of federalism I think kind of poses more questions than it does answers, partly because it's a technocratic fix to a demand for democracy and accountability and so on. I very rarely heard voters in Scotland say that all they want is just a few more powers for the Edinburgh Parliament. Um, it seems to me it's a much more fundamental issue than that. And recently, everything that Labour tries to do, I think this reflects much of the centre-left internationally in some respects, Everything that Labour does tends to reinforce its basic vacuum of legitimacy. In 2016, there was the, vet, the Brexit vote, and initially Labour didn't know what to do. They eventually resolved that they would try to reverse it or you know, uh, have a people's vote or whatever they wanted, largely because they were terrified by electoral competition in London and some of the more prosperous seats and so on, um, where there was the Greens, the Lib Dems, and so on, potentially stealing their votes. But the ultimate result of trying to please all these people was the collapse of the so-called red wall seats in Northern England. Today, Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party pictured there, is trying to win those voters back. He's doing this by waving the Union Jack 
at every available opportunity. But every time he does that, he's alienating voters in Scotland who no longer identify with that vision of British patriotism to a large extent. Although Scottish Labour has recently elected a new leader, and in some ways he seems to be relatively popular, it also seems to be the case that Labour is not going to do very well at the next election. The last opinion poll showed them going down again to 17%. So less than one in five voters plans to vote for the Labour Party, Scotland's traditional hegemonic leadership. I just want to return in conclusion to this idea of the breakup of Britain. Obviously, as I said, I didn't dwell on this, but it goes back to the notions of Tom Nairn um, and also to the related thesis that he developed, well, whether it was properly articulated or not, they're associated with it. It was himself and uh, Perry Anderson developed this idea um, that this was a product of a kind of British backwardness. Now, part of what I've tried to emphasize here is that um, if we are going to see the breakup of Britain, it's going to be in some ways because Britain was overadapted to the neoliberal phase of capitalism that we have seen in the last period. Nonetheless, I'm going to defend uh, the Anderson Neon thesis to an extent because I do think there are specific features of the British state that they identified that continue to matter. Obviously, the multinational nature of Britain is something that sets it apart. Apart from anything else, if you think about the general void of politics, what you've generally seen is a decline of class-based party politics in favour of these undifferentiated appeals to the national interests. But what happens in Britain is that you have four different sets of competing uh, national interests and different national visions and so on to reckon with, or at least four, if you consider Ireland having perhaps two uh, or so on. Also, the post-colonial status of Britain uh, matters because cosmopolitan globetrotting militarism has often functioned as a mechanism for drumming up, up support for a British national project. And as I've said, that doesn't seem to work. It doesn't seem to form the same glue of the national project that they once did. It also matters, as Perry Anderson and Tom Nairn said, that Britain is um, unconquered and doesn't have a recent revolutionary tradition. That has meant that amongst the ruling class, you often have a tendency to try and solve problems with a patch-up job which is what devolution was, and ultimately I think what proposals for federalism from the Labour Party are also going to involve. So these features I think that are specific to Britain continue to matter. Although it's also true to say that much of this reflects very standard stuff that we have seen worldwide, um, or if not worldwide, then in the states of advanced capitalism the breakdown of centre-left organisations specifically, and the void of ideological meaning that that has left in politics. The consequence of that, as I've said, is that social democratic parties like Labour can no longer discipline working class voters to stay loyal to the state and the political establishment the same way that they used to do, that they would have been able to do in the 1970s and so on. Equally, as I've said, the mainstream case for Scottish independence raises the essential emptiness of a lot of populist promises because they say that if Scotland votes yes, the people will be in charge. However, the SNP leadership openly plans to cede control of money to the Bank of England, of fiscal decisions to the EU, and so on and so forth, which raises the question of where and over what the people are meant to meaningfully assert control. Finally, just in my own position, um, for me, there are elements of backwardness, that, which probably should be called backwardness in some ways, in the British state that you can't just vote away. Even in an era defined, as Peter Mayer said, by the hollowing of democracy, Westminster's voting system makes it particularly easy to disenfranchise working class voters. The state's post-colonial identity means it is institutionally prone to and ideologically dependent on warfare, 
And given current electoral arithmetic, I think it's likely that the Conservatives will be in charge for some time ahead um, of the key decisions that I would consider to be key to a state, namely those of monetary policy, um, of basic economic institutions, and also uh, war making, foreign policy, and so on. I'm no great fan of the EU, as I will explain on Thursday, but nonetheless, there is a certain truth to the idea of Scotland being brought out of it against its will, and certainly of Scottish institutions being given a relatively limited say in the process of Brexit negotiations. The Tories currently get one in five votes in Scotland. So you can see that the, regardless of what it is that happens, even if you have another patch-up job, even if you have this idea of progressive federalism, whatever that turns out to mean, there is likely to be an ongoing and persistent democratic deficit that nationalists of whatever stripe will be able to exploit. That's going to persist unless there's some serious change. Lastly, just one last point. The 2014 referendum was the first time many people had experienced a meaningful sense of political agency. I'm of the view that if you're serious about reviving a viable political left, broadly speaking, you have to engage with political mobilization, or indeed with what political, uh, with what Bernie Sanders called a political revolution. What you saw in 2014 with that referendum was working class voters defying instructions from many of the strongest institutions in the land and asserting their own agency. Regardless of the many problems that I've seen with the SNP's prospectus for independence, I feel that all of that is worthy of respect and consideration, not just in Scotland, but beyond. Equally, lastly, I think the challenge for us in Scotland is pretty much the same as all left party, you know, the left populist forces, broadly speaking, that have emerged as anti-establishment forces in the last period. They've all got essentially the same dilemma, which is how does all this mobilization that we have been doing, which is undoubtedly there around the question of Scottish independence, how does this lead to a permanent revival, revival in the collective power and agency, specifically of those sections that have been shut out of politics across much of the world over the last four decades? I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, James. That was a fascinating introduction. Uh, so uh, I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. OK, now we have plenty of time for questions and comments and so on. So uh, let me just uh, walk you through how to do this. Uh, you can electronically raise your hand that if you go to the bottom uh, uh, and click on the reactions icon in the toolbar, uh, there's the option for you to raise hand. If you do that, um, I will see you and I will call on you and uh, you can then uh, unmute yourself. I just ask that uh, if you would like to ask a question, um, uh, please, uh, please do switch on your video when you're asking it. it. It is much better for the recording and so on. And also, if you'd like to ask a question, but you'd rather not um, uh, you know, be on video, feel free to type a question into the chat and then I'll read it out for you. So I have one person indicated. Uh, so that's Michael. I'll bring you in right now. And anyone else that would uh, like to ask a question. I'm gonna try and ask them in groups of three. Uh, so anyone else that has a question, please do raise your hand as well. Michael. Thank you very much, uh, Pete. And thank you very much, James, for that, that excellent lecture. That was very informative. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, just on Britain and Scottish independence, um, could it be argued that in an age of universal suffrage and capitalism, uh, the only firm foundation for preserving the union uh, was a political economy based on nationalized industries and their unionized workforces uh, that had both a shared national and class interest. And with uh, neoliberal, neo, neoliberalization neoliberal, neo and privatization of large areas of industry, that foundation has been eroded. And thus there's this inability for unionist politicians um, to form a coherent narrative um, that can counter the uh, calls and, and the 
uh, campaigning for both Scottish and Welsh independence. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michael. I've also got a question from Hazel. Uh, go ahead, Hazel. Thanks. Um, good evening. And thanks very much for a very interesting um, uh, lecture beforehand. But I'd like to take you up on one or two things. Um, the, the emergence of the new party that um, Alex Salmond has brought forward, the Alipa party, um, it, it does demonstrate how our devolved parliament um, voting system has been set up um, to really skew um, the, the, the votes that are cast on, on, if you've got a majority in the, um, if you have a majority of the constituency votes, um, then the SNP, as it did in 2016, I think there were nearly a million or more than a million votes for the SNP that were just completely wasted because of the way the voting, the AMS voting system, the DeHomp voting system works. And as, as Alex Salmond is demonstrating, um, and, and the, the, the mostly unionist press in Scotland is, is busy saying that he's trying to game the system. Um, would you say, therefore, that the, um, the, the system was being gamed up until this point by unionism and the unionist? Um, I mean, we, we, we are hobbled um, if we are talking from a, um, an SMP point of view. And I just want if you agreed with that. Thanks very much, Hazel. Um, I don't have anyone else who's indicated to come in, so I'll bring James back in just now. Just on that uh, last point, um, I mean, there is this talk of gaming the system. Um, I don't know what this is always called internationally. I believe this is called the Jefferson um, system in America, and it's the DeHaunt system. Uh, over here, um, but it's basically the party list electoral system, which combines constituency voting, um, but also we have um, a party list system and voters opt for uh, a party and they elect people on that basis. The specific accusation is that basically we're going to go with Alex Salmon's proposed new party, the likelihood is that there will be some sort of super majority for independence um, in the Scottish Parliament, which is arguably not reflective of overall public opinion. So there's a potential that they could have 70% of seats for pro-independence parties, for instance, even though only 50% of people have voted for uh, pro-independence parties and so on and so forth. And this has led to accusations of gaming the system, et cetera, et cetera. Firstly, it needs to be remembered uh, that this system was deliberately set up in order to prevent the SNP and Scottish independence forces from taking power in the first place. That was its initial intention. Um, and therefore, it was set up by unionists, for unionists, in order to prevent these people from taking control. So in a sense, they are hoisted with their own petard, if this is the actual case. It's also worth saying as well that uh, parties regularly gain, if not super majorities, and certainly stonking majorities in the Westminster Parliament, while getting little over 40% of the electorate. One instance of this is uh, Boris Johnson recently, but you also have uh, Tony, some of Tony Blair's government only got just over 40% and yet nonetheless had very comfortable majorities and so on and so forth. So arguably they don't particularly represent public opinion either. I think it looks like the case is going to be that regardless of whether Alex Salmond had been there, there would be a reasonably comfortable majority of pro-independence forces within the electoral system. Nonetheless, look, I mean, there are issues around the overall system that could be raised in, in terms of its representativeness and so on. What can't really be escaped 
is that there is, if not a majority, then a 50-50 split pretty persistently around the question of independence. And I think it gets to the stage where you can't reasonably be expected to ignore that. Ultimately, I think it will be uh, to the detriment of Westminster politics as well. Essentially, it becomes impossible. I mean, initially, it used to be the case that Scottish Labour voters propped up Labour governments, even if that was somewhat exaggerated. They certainly gave them more comfortable majorities than they might otherwise have had. I think now the opposite dynamic essentially plays out, where because Scotland's likely to vote for the SNP for most of the seats, that puts off uh, some voters in England from voting for the Labour Party, um, precisely because you might end up with an SNP Labour coalition, which has been the sort of fear uh, campaign that the, the Tories have run over the last several elections. In relation to Michael's point, um, I mean, I'm, I'm personally not against the idea of multinational uh, states, but I think it, you do have to understand that Britain is relatively peculiar in its multinational type that might well have been the case in much of Europe prior to the First World War, but Britain survived because we won two world, war, world wars, uh, which I think is one of the legitimate parts of the anderson Nairn thesis that continues to be rele uh, relevant this day. Much of that persisted because of the loyalties of empire. Um, subsequently, much of it persisted due to the uh, loyalties that were embedded in the welfare state, the British social democratic tradition and so on. Now, we're at the situation where, because there had been so much Thatcherite attacks on the state that persisted to an extent under Tony Blair and were radicalized under David Cameron with the austerity program, it had become the case by 2014 that the people who were defending the supposedly British traditions of solidarity rooted in the welfare state and so on were purely and simply Scottish nationalists, right? the SNP and the Yes movement and so on and so forth, which is kind of indicative of the wider breakdown uh, of which Peter Mayer spoke in uh, the hollowing of democratic processes and so on. So I think, yes, there's definitely some legitimacy to the point of view that Michael articulated there. Thanks very much, James. So I've got a couple of people with their hands up. I have Lynn, I've got three people, fantastic. So I'll take all of you. Lynn Jones, I will take you first. Thank you, yes. Um, uh, James, you spoke about the the glue that holds uh, with the working class to the state, uh, the working people more generally. Um, and that's in sort of a symptomatic of the, uh, of the void of which Peter Mayer spoke. If Scotland were to become independent, what would fill that void? Where, where would the glue come from? Would the center left be strong enough to regain that role in the state or not, do you think? Thanks very much, Lynn. Uh, I have George Caravan and Ben, uh, and I'm not going to try and pronounce your second name, Ben, because I'm not going to pronounce it right. But we'll start with George and then move on to Ben. Hello, Jimmy. Got me there. You're, you're on mute, George. Oh, there you I'm are. Sorting, sorting. Right. Um, I just wanted to ask what your thoughts were on the interaction of the different national struggles within the UK, I mean, obviously between Scotland and Northern Ireland, but also now that Wales is showing an upsurge in support for independence. I mean, does, does the dynamic of the interaction of the constituent parts of the, of the UK have, a, a, have an impact on the nature of what, what goes on next? Thanks very much, George. Ben. Thanks all. Um, yeah, so my question, it sort of follows on quite well there. And hello from Wales. Uh, the last name is Welsh. That's probably why it's unpronounceable. Um, yes, my question follows on. Uh, should the SNP or whoever forms the next government and have uh, uh, enough of a weighted, um, I was going to say Senedd, but that's our place, uh, Holyrood, Parliament uh, for an independence vote or, you know, the democratic will they're in and however they get it and that independence vote, whether it's via Westminster or not, 
I was wondering, James, do you have an opinion or models on the effect of 16 and 17 year olds, as Nicola Sturgeon has said she would love to vote in that? Now, here in Wales, we've recently, and, and this will be our first election, where not just 16 and 17 year olds, but foreign nationals as well will be able to vote uh, for our parliament here. So, do you have an opinion or models, I wonder? on uh, how that might affect uh, an independence vote, please. Thanks very much, Ben. And uh, your name definitely isn't impronounceable, it's just impronounceable by me, so apologies for that. Uh, James, I'll bring you in to answer all those questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I mean, in a sense, in Scotland, the answer to that has been very direct. I mean, certainly in recent history, it has tended to be the case that older people are by far the least likely to vote for independence. I believe it to be the case, I'd have to double check this, that in the 2014 vote, if you exclude the vote of pensioners, then Scotland would have been independent in some virtual sense. Um, and it tended to be the case that the younger you were, not exclusively, but this tended to work as a model, the more younger you were, the uh, more likely you were to be in favour of independence, which is obviously the reverse of what you saw with another populist moment of Brexit. Um, and I think that's significant. It might well have to do with uh, the, uh, the socially liberal nature, shall we say, of the independence movement and some of these wider cultural dynamics. But I think more broadly, why does that happen? It tends to be the case that a lot of older voters will remember some of the achievements uh, of the welfare state, of an idea of British solidarity, of a world even before devolution, um, and some of these ideas might well be more embedded in them. Some of these ideas will be progressive. Some of these ideas will also be reactionary monarchism and whatever it happens to be. And you see the complex interaction of them. But broadly speaking, if you're from a younger generation, it tends to be the case that the British state has not done the same things, in perception at least, for you. And what you may have experienced was Brexit, which of course, uh, many younger voters didn't vote for, regardless of whether it's legitimate or not. So it, I think it will tend to be the case that if, if you allow 16 or 17 year olds to vote, it will quite frankly be seen as gaming the system in favour of uh, uh, the pro-independence forces, broadly speaking. On the other hand, there's, a, in, there's, a, there's an argument to be said, and it often was in relation to Scotland, that these are the people with the most investment in the future, um, and that the votes around independence, which may well happen in the British state, are largely about what's going to happen, some would say, over the next 10, 20, 30 years, rather than in the next electoral cycle. Um, whether that's legitimate or not, there's a number of debates to be had, but my expectation would be that this would accelerate processes towards pro-independence forces gaining majorities. Now, uh, George asked about the interaction of the forces. I mean, in some ways, there's been surprisingly little in the sense of formal engagements. Partly this is because the two most um, interlinked uh, questions and the two most viable independence movements, I mean, no disrespect to Ben when I say this, um, are Ireland and uh, Scotland. Now, it tends to be the case that in Scottish history, there has been a lot of anti-Irish discrimination. It's a very live question, which has been uh, difficult for the SNP sometimes to handle. The Irish minority in Scotland has been, uh, well, when I was growing up as a person of Irish extraction, we were told not to vote for the SNP because they were a Protestant party. Um, now, that has changed significantly because now there is a significant majority, at least since 2014, of the Irish minority in Scotland in favour of uh, independence. But nonetheless, the SNP has found it difficult to handle this. They've introduced legislation which is um, arguably discriminated against national identity of Irishness and so on. So for this reason, it has tended to be the case that there has not been the interaction that we might well have expected. I think it's something that the left should look at, though, because frankly, in terms of understanding our own national context in Scotland, 
I think it's important that we have a sympathy for all the dynamics of the Irish nation, which includes, of course, the unionist dynamics as well. But it's part of our own history as well. And there is a lot of interconnection. And I think, just to answer the question directly, our own fates are obviously interlinked, right? Because if Scotland does move towards independence, it will accelerate the force of moves towards Irish uh, reunification. And in that sense, when our fates are linked, the case for internationalism becomes pragmatic as well as just some sort of ideological thing. Um, and therefore we really should be engaging in more, uh, more discussions with our colleagues in England, Wales, Ireland, but also beyond to Catalonia and to many other places. Just largely, um, and, and lastly, pardon me, in terms of what Lynn said, I think it's a great question. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I have no intention of answering it. Like, uh, it's really the question though, that I posed in some ways as well, like, which I think is the question for all left populist politics that we've seen since 2008, which is like, you have this reversal of Peter Miller's void temporarily with these appeals to the popular interest and so on. How do they lead to this rebuilding of popular power? I, now, um, the, uh, I would hope that existing collective institutions such as trade unions may well, um, at the very least, facilitate debates when it comes to the question of independence and so on. And it might re-energize them with new layers of you know, activists trained up in how to mobilize and so on. But it is a difficult question. It's one we've not entirely solved. One of the most promising things, though, is that there are areas where we have had some success. I don't want to speak too much about America because I'm bound to be exposed in my ignorance. But I do know it to be the case that uh, the Bernie Sanders campaign did have some at least peripheral impact in terms of uh, re-energizing activists into other campaigns that were not just about the particularities of the Sanders election campaign, including in some cases of trade unionism. Now, hopefully there are lessons that we can draw in there in terms of Scotland, but I wouldn't see that there are obviously any guarantees. What I would like to do though, is avoid some of the mistakes that were made often by the Labour Party, which is to say, well, this isn't directly leading to the you know, kind of economic reforms we want or the kind of um, campaigning at community level that we want and so on, so we're not going to listen to it. I think it's vitally important that we do listen when people start demanding accountability and when people exert their agency against often what the establishment is wanting them to do. Part of being you know, any type of leftist is to believe in democracy. And uh, I do think that these are important democratic upsurges in and of their own right, regardless of whether we agree with them on every single question. Thanks very much, James. I have a couple of questions in the chat, although I don't have anyone. I've got one person with their hand raised, so I'll read out the questions first and then I'll bring in Anne. So the first question is, wouldn't Scotland be better positioned vis-a-vis -vis England to make uh, the transition uh, by allying with Ireland and Wales to construct a sort of Celtic union? Uh, and the other question is from C. Cash. Here in America, certain religious groups have had a major impact on national politics. Is there any religious focus in Scottish politics as it affects Brexit? Uh, so we've got those two questions, and I would just add as a little comment that there are no bad questions or comments. Absolutely all views are welcome here. So I've now got Anne as well, who will ask a Third question, and if you could uh, switch on your video camera while you're asking uh, the question, that'd be fantastic. But don't worry if you can. Okay, my camera's on now. Um, I was just wondering, I know that uh, after uh, the referendum for Brexit, Corbyn the entire way through and then even after wasn't really um, that vocal and he kind of was a little bit he wasn't really committed to saying that the Labour Party was pro-Brexit or against Brexit. And I, a lot of people kind of expressed frustration that he was so wishy-washy about it. So do you think that the fact that the SNP um, was overwhelmingly anti-Brexit and very vocal about how that will negatively affect Scotland kind of made more people want to vote for the SNP or did that do anything at all? 
Thanks very much, Anne. So there's three questions for you, James. And to anyone else who would like to, I think we'll have time for one last quick round of questions uh, after James has finished answering these ones. Was the question about religion specifically in relation to Brexit? Because it does bear, um, there, is, there is a slight difference there, um, I, particularly with the question about Scotland. I mean, the broad answer to that is that, yes, there is a religious dynamic in Scotland um, because, um, well, it, it's it, it, you might call it religious, right? There is obviously a Catholic-Protestant divide in terms of the electorate, which maps on to the Irish question historically and so on. It probably tended to be the case that much of the way that the, if to the extent that there was a pro-Brexit vote, in Scotland and certainly any mobilisation, much of it, much of it will have come through, as it were, the historically not just Protestant but sort of militantly Protestant elements that might be close to the uh, Conservative Party, or to the Orange Lodge, or various of these types of institutions. Um, in relation to uh, whether being against Brexit has been part of the reason for the SNP's success? The answer to that, I think, is a very qualified yes. It's true to say that a third, roughly speaking, of SNP voters, um, and maybe 30%, but it's maybe slightly above that, uh, did vote for um, Brexit. Um, and therefore, there is a significant minority there. Historically, the SNP at one stage was opposed to the European uh, project. Um, but uh, there's also a sort of, there are fishing communities and others that had various reasons for being opposed to the European Union. And there were elements of Euroscepticism there. But I think it did allow Nicola Sturgeon to present as a strong, unified national leader um, for Scotland. Her phrase always was stronger for Scotland. Um, certainly it often looked like the Scottish national public will was being repressed by Westminster and there was a lot of truth in some ways to that appearance. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think probably it did play a role, but it's a qualified role. Pete has done some research on this, I know. And one of the things, I don't think he's published it yet, but um, one of the things that I think does come out of Pete's research is that after 2016, there was a particular transformation in the types of social classes that were most likely to be pro-independence and pro-SNP. And what you basically see is that the SNP and the independence vote becomes a bit more middle class. Like uh, and significantly more middle class in certain areas amongst managers and so on, which is probably related to the overall dynamics of uh, of that vote. Now, what again was the third question? Pardon me. Now, the third question was from Anne. Anne, do you want to come back in and just quick, quickly elaborate? Oh, I, think that, I think that was the one I just uh, attempted oh. to answer. Um, uh, sorry, the third question was around the uh, Celtic Union. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess my kind of take on that would be, uh, look, uh, most of our trade ultimately is still going to be with other parts of the United Kingdom, right? And once we get independence, and maybe that accelerates this process of the breakup of Britain, maybe you do start to reform some of these links, whether they're trading links, cultural links, et cetera, et cetera on a new basis of uh, sovereign entities. Whether that specifically takes the form of a unified state, I would doubt, but it may well take the form of a sort of unified trading block with uh, cultural links and these other things that you might well have seen in the Nordic countries, for instance. So yes, I think that's definitely a big prospect. Thanks very much, James. Okay, I've not got any hands, but we have a couple of more questions uh, in the chat. So this one is from Ronnie Boyd. Excellent lecture. If, as is expected, there is a majority in the Scottish uh, elections for pro-independent parties, what does James see as the mechanism or route to a referendum, given that Johnson's government will simply say no? So that's the first one. And secondly, from Michael Doyle, a silly question. These are his words, not mine. Uh, will Tommy Sheridan joining Alaba mean that Salmon's new party will storm to power in May? Um, I think, James, you'd have to explain very briefly who Tommy uh, Sheridan is. Uh, and that is all the questions that we've got in just now.
how to explain Tommy Sheridan to an American audience. Um, it's very, very difficult, like, because there's not really a comparable thing. He is, like, uh, the most indescribably Scottish of entities. Like, I mean, I guess if you think of a combination of uh, Braveheart um, and uh, a sort of shipyard worker and uh, maybe Billy Connolly, I don't know, like... Uh, it's a very difficult thing, but he is basically a socialist uh, politician who was brought down in a scandal earlier in the uh, period of Scottish history. I have no intention of dragging that particular question out. Um, the fact is that Tommy Sheridan is a very unique character, shall we say, who was once uh, the most popular politician in Scotland and is now one of the most frowned upon. I guess it's probably true to say that there are, um, he, he has some parallels with Alex Salmond because Alex Salmond has also been involved in his own range of scandals. He's technically, um, if you look at opinion polls, not, particular, uh, not particularly popular overall, but he's also someone that could decisively probably influence uh, the upcoming events in various different ways. It doesn't always have to be the case that you have popularity across the country in order that you can um, influence the course of political events. And it probably will be the case. I mean, I, I don't think Tommy, to, Tommy is a particularly comical character that I just cannot describe. Um, you really have to be Scottish to understand him. Like he's one of these, uh, one of these characters. Um, but Alex Salmond himself uh, may well end up having a big role to play in terms of the way that things shake out over the coming years, um, for good or ill, many would say. Now, as for uh, how to engineer a referendum and self-determination, I'm as much open to suggestions as anyone else in some respects, but I do think it will take more than just achieving a parliamentary majority. The likelihood is, to me, that what's going to happen is that we will have a pro-independence majority at the next Scottish election. The leadership will request some sort of new referendum, as has been done politely before, and in all likelihood, it will be knocked back. My own perception of what needs to be done here is essentially that uh, we need to... Um, we need to spread the question to some extent beyond the question of Scotland um, and start thinking about this as a problem that applies as much in Ireland, Wales, uh, England, as much as anywhere else, because the repression of self-determination ultimately, I suppose, has this much broader meaning for democracy. I think we could start mobilising uh, opinion beyond Scotland and refocusing the campaign on London to some extent, then we maybe will have slightly more success than we've had in the past. But I also think it will require some popular mobilization inside Scotland, partly uh, aimed at the own leadership of the Scottish Parliament, the SNP and so on, in order that they properly take the question um, seriously. Because my prediction would be that all other things remaining equal, the next five years in Scotland may well look rather like uh, the previous period, which is to say that we will have a dominant uh, pro-independence majority in Parliament, technically will always be six months away or whatever it is from a referendum, but we might not get significant progress uh, towards that aim. So I think much will depend on the agency of the public and broader civil society in Scotland. Thanks very much, James. And you have timed the answering of those questions perfectly. We are going to finish right on time. So I'd just like to invite everyone to give a virtual round of applause to James. That was fantastic. Um, and I'd invite you all to join us again next Thursday, uh, not next Thursday, sorry, this Thursday at exactly the same time, you can log in using the same link. So please join us then where we'll move from the crisis of Britain to the crisis of Europe, which I think is going to be a fantastic transition. Just before I go, I'd like to give another round of thanks to the co-sponsors to, uh, to this event, which are the Jean Monnet European Union Centre of Excellence for Comparative Populism, the University of Wisconsin-Madison Department of 
the political science and Contour, uh, a political magazine uh, in Scotland, uh, which James is on the editorial board of. So thank you all again. I will see you all on Thursday, and I hope you have a lovely end to the rest of your day. Thank you so much, everyone.